Here we go. <laughs> just wait, just wait. <laughs> well, <laughs> I should start uh, by saying um, sexy nerds doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to stand up here and talk about the nerds whom I find sexy. Um, not that I don't have, uh, you know, very well thought out opinions on the subject. Uh, actually, if you go to Revolution Science Fiction, which is revolutionsf.com, uh, you will find one of the works I'm most proud of. It's one of the least academic works I've written, um, called uh, basically Science Fiction and Fantasy Hunks, The Definitive List, The Last Five Decades. Um, or if you go to my website, you can, you can find it there. So I definitely have uh, well thought out opinions on this subject. Uh, or you could ask me at, in the Q&A if you wish. But uh, basically, this talk is about the development of the cerebral hero in uh, television drama. And this comes from a project that I did with, uh, with Cindy Walker, who's at Rutgers. I'm at Belmont. Uh, I'm Amy Sturgis, by the way. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, tracing the sexy nerd uh, as he has progressed, as she has progressed uh, from the 1960s to today. Let me start out by saying that the word nerd has been used regularly since the 1960s. Um, it can be traced back to Dr. Seuss, actually. Uh, Dr. Seuss, in his book, If I Ran the Zoo, had the very first nerd. In that children's book, the nerd is pictured as a short, hairy, disheveled fellow uh, that has a sour and grumpy expression on his face. But uh, if you go to the dictionary, like uh, Merriam-Webster today, uh, you get nerd as, quote, an unstylish, unattractive, or socially inept person, especially, especially one slavishly devoted to intellectual or academic pursuits. An egghead, right? Uh, a brain, a brainiac, a dork, a grind, a member of the pocket protector brigade. That's what the nerd is. Uh, but we see something really interesting with the nerd as he and she have uh, become uh, really heroes. The Industrial Revolution brought about really the person we think of as the first uh, nerd hero, and that's uh, Sherlock Holmes. We get villains all the time who are you know, mad scientists in their laboratory doing things they shouldn't be doing, right? But we finally get uh, a brainiac who's, who's going out and taking care of business, and that's Sherlock Holmes. Interestingly enough, when Sherlock Holmes is brought to the silver screen or, uh, or to television, really, we usually see him turned into sort of an action-adventure hero, which is unusual. Um, but although Holmes is someone to be admired, certainly uh, Watson thinks very, very highly of him. Uh, he solves his cases. He gets his job done. Uh, we don't necessarily think of him as a sex god. It just doesn't strike us that the guy in the little tweed hat is is got all that going on. Uh, so the question of where uh, the sexy nerd really develops comes a question, I think, of television. The sexy nerds start out being kind of a sidekick, someone who helps the hero, who uh, starts out being always male, um, who's buff and action-oriented, the sidekick comes along and really kind of uh, gives information to the hero so the hero can go do heroic things. But as the computer age progresses, the sexy nerd character evolves. He evolves from the sidekick to the partner, from the partner to the lead, and from a he to a she. And one of the things that uh, Cindy and I found when we were doing our research is that there are great leaps in popularity with the sexy nerd. We see more of them pop up and really have an impact on popular culture during key moments when the audience itself makes a technological leap. So not necessarily the nerdiest of the nerds are discovering this, but a certain critical mass of people are becoming comfortable with new technology. Um, the second generation supercomputers in the mid-1960s, uh, when Apple creates the first Macintosh uh, uh, personal computer uh, in the mid-80s, and it becomes used to a wide degree. Um, the World Wide Web uh, in the early 1990s, and then the wireless uh, revolution 
both with computers and with cell phones in the late 90s to, to today. We can actually see a correlation there with when a certain degree of the population gets comfortable with this technology, you see a new batch of sexy nerds come across. Let me say a quick word about methodology. Get that behind me so then we can get on to the sexiness. Uh, first of all, the way we determined who was sexy, again, was not necessarily our own, although certain members uh, of the slideshow that I will show you did turn up on my science fiction fantasy top hunks list. But, uh, but we looked at fan reaction, uh, fans writing into television studios, writing to the stars themselves, um, having some kind of publicity campaign for the, the uh, excuse me, for the fan, uh, for the particular sexy nerd. Um, fan fiction being written about a character, uh, fan art being produced about a character, really a proactive um, fan groups spontaneously forming and having activities that in the end seem to uh, live longer than the characters themselves on television. Uh, so you can see these spikes of popularity and I'll give you individual examples as we talk about individual sexy nerds. Uh, and I don't think it's any surprise that these sexy nerds are most often found in sci-fi genre television. Um, because the computer lake, again, is very, very clear. In regular television, there's a long history, non-genre television, of nerds really being the butts of jokes. Um, you can go all the way back to the quiz kids in the late 40s and early 50s, Mr. Peepers in the early 50s, um, you know, the Steve Urkels, basically, from Family Matters, and the Walter Dentons from Armis Brooks back in the 50s, the Barney Fights, um, the Beavis and Buttheads, the antisocial bumbling people who uh, often have something going on upstairs, but you really can't tell through all of the geekiness that's oozing out of them from every pore. And so they are basically the butts of the jokes, but not with the sexy nerds. The sexy nerd, we argue, began in 1964. with Ilya Kuryakin. <laughs> well done, from the man from UNCLE. Now, Ilya is a very interesting story. Um, when the man from UNCLE first came out, a spy show, uh, it's considered science fiction because all of the gadgetry that was involved with it. Really, what you've got is James Bond for television. And uh, the man from UNCLE was Napoleon Solo, who was Robert Vaughn, the actor, was, was uh, cast for Napoleon Solo. Suave, sophisticated, undeniably attractive man who went around in suits, wooed ladies, uh, and got the bad guys, Thrush. Uh, the first several episodes focused on Napoleon. But there was this other guy who worked for UNCLE, the UNCLE organization as well, Ilya Kuryakin. Very interesting in the middle of the Cold War that a Russian character was paired uh, with an American character as allies. Uh, Ilya had a lot of things going on. He was uh, a PhD in quantum mechanics. He uh, wore white lab coats and fed things into basically a refrigerator-sized computer that blinked at him and spit stuff back out. Anybody needs to touch the computer, Ilya's got to do it. And although he was small and slight and very fair-faced and blonde-haired, he wore these monster black horn-rimmed glasses when he was playing with the computer or when he was in the chemistry section pouring things into beakers. He kind of transformed into this uber geek while he was doing this sort of thing. But he was mysterious. Women characters threw themselves at him and he kind of rebuked them. He was cool. He was aloof. He was unavailable, right? Uh, he, there was the uh, occasional hint that he had jazz records that he listened to. He was countercultural. Where Napoleon wore suits and ties, Ilya wore black turtlenecks with black jackets. He looked like a beat poet. He was kind of hippie. He had his hair longer, kind of a beetle haircut. He showed up as sort of not even a sidekick, just a peripheral character in a couple of episodes. And the women went wild. They wrote letters, they drew pictures, they begged for more Ilya. And before you knew it, Ilya and Napoleon were partners, paired, and they did everything together. Um, in classic, you always hurt the ones you love fashion, Ilya got 
stripped and beaten and whipped and electrocuted and drowned and tortured in just about every episode, suffered beautifully while doing it, like James Kirk later would, lost his shirt a lot. And, uh, and, and the women loved it. And the show uh, won Golden Globe Awards. It was the most successful uh, television series for its time and made David McCallum a star. Uh, and here, all these years later, he's still on television, uh, thanks to it. Uh, also came back for a reunion movie in 1983. Ilya Kuryakin, yes, yes, Navy CSI right now. Um, so he's doing very well uh, for himself. Uh, as this shy, mysterious, lab coat wearing, horn rimmed glasses wearing PhD in the sciences, uh, he captured women's hearts and became what we argue is really the first cerebral hero. And he paved the way for really the poster child for cerebral heroes who followed him a year later Mr. Spock. Uh, Mr. Spock also was supposed to be the cool, aloof, logical character. Um, if Ilya was logical by temperament, Mr. Spock was logical really as a matter of religion, in a sense. Um, he was supposed to be second fiddle to uh, Kirk, who was the suave ladies' man, right? Uh, like Napoleon Solo. Um, but Spock was immediately immensely popular, and as the series went on, uh, had to fend off a number of love interests um, with whom he could never actually consummate any romance because he was too cool for that. He was too aloof. Um, he was, if Ilya liked computers and was a scientist, uh, Spock, obviously the science officer, was computer-like. His entire character was computer-like uh, and was actually called a computer by, uh, by Dr. McCoy. Um, he took facts in and could give them back. In fact, he could tell you what time it was down to the second just because that was the way his brain was doing. He was a walking, talking computer, basically. Um, he also was the one who fed information into the computer and got it back out. Uh, interesting, considering really the genesis of the cerebral hero, a lot of fan fiction written about him um, conflated him with Sherlock Holmes to the point that one uh, scholar wrote an article um, pretty early in the whole Star Trek experience, was Sherlock Holmes a Vulcan? Because uh, Spock was being portrayed over and over again as the Sherlock Holmes character, running around and solving mysteries in, in a way that you know was very akin to Baker Street. So obviously a tie uh, being made there. When, after the second season, Star Trek uh, was having ratings problems and was threatened with cancellation, women wrote in, in incredible numbers. They weren't writing in with flyers that said, we think Star Trek is dealing with relevant issues in a new and exciting way, and so we'd like to see these current events brought about with the metaphor of science fiction, so please don't cancel this, sh this show. They wrote in with flyers that said, we grok Spock. And that's what saved the show. Now, of course, that also showing where the audience was coming from, the verb grok coming from uh, Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, exactly. So uh, they were showing their, uh, their literati status while saying, that's why we're watching. We're watching Spock. When the very first fanzine was published with fan fiction, it was called Spocknalia, a play on Bocknalia, which basically means a big orgy. When uh, fan fiction took off then a couple of years later, this was uh, 1969, uh, and started standalone fanzines that were basically novels written by fan fiction writers. One of the first and certainly the most notorious was Spock Enslaved, which the cover of which showed Spock in a loincloth wrapped in chains, uh, standing there looking oh so vulnerable and ready to be ravished by the fans. Uh, so Spock definitely considered the sexy nerd. Um, I want to, I'm going to be going chronologically, but I'd like to take a break for just a moment and follow the Star Trek theme because Star Trek really has a history, a consistent history of the sexy nerds. So let's, let's keep going with Star Trek for a moment. When we see Star Trek again, we see the character of Data. Uh, we have gone from Spock, who is like a, a, a computer, 
a Vulcan is like a computer in the way it, he thinks, in the way he acts, to a character who is a computer, an android. Uh, once again, Data is the outsider, right? He's not a part of everything. Ilya is not because he's a Russian and because by personality and training, he's sort of outside, the cool aloof scientist. Uh, Spock is an outsider because he's a Vulcan. Uh, Data is an outsider because he's not human, uh, would like to be, but isn't, is trying to figure humanity out. Early on in the show, uh, we see an example of Data with um, the very masculine and very aggressive Tasha Yar, uh, proving that he is, quote, fully functional in every possible way. <laughs> 365 different ways. Uh, the subject of much fan art and fan fiction after that. Uh, apparently, he still gets very graphic pictures sent to him of, of ways in which he has displayed his fully functional status. Um, fe uh, feminist critic Camille Palia uh, actually wrote the, uh, that Data was the ultimate thinking woman's sex symbol in her article, article uh, Data, you made me love you, I didn't want to do it. Uh, when, she, when asked to sum up what she loved about Star Trek, she said Data. So uh, once again, you have uh, the sexy nerd. Uh, Spiner Films, by the way, uh, Brent Spiner playing Data, uh, basically uh, inspired a group of uh, lusty women fans called Spiner Films, who are alive and well today, who follow him around where he goes and reminds him that he is, in fact, still the sexiest nerd out there. Um, moving along, when Deep Space Nine came along, uh, actually had two characters, um, one who was intended to be sexy uh, eventually uh, in the casting, and one who became sexy when nobody thought he was going to be. Uh, Dr. Bashir uh, once again continues this um, computer link uh, by being the research uh, doctor uh, in medicine. He's constantly creating programs to uh, find answers to, uh, to different illnesses, but Several years into the show, we find out that he's actually genetically engineered and has things such as uh, a complete and total recall with his memory, which makes him very much computer-like, right? Uh, he is an outsider because of these genetic modifications and because of the fact that he's very young and brilliant in a space station that is mined, uh, that is manned pretty significantly by... Um, by kind of old guard folks, jaded folks, cynical folks who've been around quite a while. Here's this young genius coming in. Uh, and so he fits the archetype in several ways. Odo, likewise, is non-human. He's on the outside uh, because he is a shapeshifter. He is literally alien to them, even when uh, all the folks at Deep Space Nine know a lot of aliens. What's interesting about him is, like Spock, he harkens back to Sherlock Holmes. He's constantly reading mystery novels. His position as a constable leads him to be the mystery solver on the ship. And so he takes uh, clues and finds out who did wrong and holds them accountable. Um, Bashir was cast with uh, uh, a handsome young actor that everyone expected to be, um, really kind of a takeoff character. And that happened, and a lot of fan fiction, a lot of fan art uh, uh, surrounded him. Uh, Odo wasn't considered to be a character that, that was going for the sex appeal, and yet uh, immediately fan response about him uh, was really sort of overwhelming. And in fact, uh, when the show ends, not terribly happily for many of the, the characters involved, the two characters who basically have gotten the girl are these two. Um, Constable Odo with Kira Norris and Dr. Bashir with Esri Dax. So uh, that kind of pays off for them. Um, <laughs> we don't talk about Wesley. That's just, we're just making an agreement right now. We're not going to talk about him. Um, but Star Trek also goes along with, uh, with the trend of uh, the way the sexy nerd has developed by, um, by moving to women characters as well. Again, both having the connection with, uh, with the computer uh, very visually. Seven of Nine, when she came on the Star Trek Voyager, was brought in specifically because of sex appeal. They wanted a character who would bring in the guys and the demographic uh, that Star Trek was trying to appeal to. And so they put her in her little uh, cat suit 
And she did exactly that, and the ratings immediately went up. Uh, and she, both she, uh, uh, Jerry Ryan, Angeline Blaylock, um, did the circuit of you know uh, cheese cheesecake photos to go along with that um, for the sex symbol status. But when you see Seven of Nine for the first time, she's half Borg, and what that means is that she's covered with uh, with basically wires and blinking things so that we have the sense that she has actually been turned into a computer. She's sort of cyborg-like, right? She is, is computer in a way. Uh, she is technology. You are confronted visually with the technological aspect of her character immediately. Once these things are taken away, and there's only a few things left to show this, um, we know this because of the way she talks. She cons considers humans in a way that's very reminiscent of Mr. Spock. And so when she goes to Harry Kim, the young, handsome uh, character, and says, I am interested in human sexuality. It is time now for you to undress. We shall copulate. This isn't the most romantic seduction ever made, um, but it's the notion that she's not really fully human, that there's something mechanical about her, is actually exciting, right? Um, to Paul on Star Trek Enterprise, which is currently on right now, uh, is Vulcan. Uh, like like Spock, in fact, more than Spock, because Spock is only half Vulcan, uh, and she her computer-like responses. She's also a scientist, uh, like Spock was, uh, and so once again you see this recurring theme. She's the one who stands at the console and looks uh, and gets the information, and then tells Captain Ar Archer what she finds. Uh, and when he wants something, he asks her, and she talks to the computer, and then she comes back. And so she's basically his link with all of the technological information uh, that he needs to have. But she also responds to things in a very dry and mechanical way, which uh, uh, adds to this whole notion that somehow she's, you know, she's got the nerd thing going on in a way. But uh, according to fan response for Jolene Blaylock, uh, and if you look at Maxine Magazine and see her, her, uh, her spreads there, uh, it's very clear that um, uh, the fan response is exactly what uh, the folks were hoping for at Star Trek when they cast her and put her in the particular cat suit that she wears. Now, to go back to my, um, my chronology, let's back up again and let's go back to, um, to what's going on uh, in the chronology. We had Ilya Kiriakin in the 60s. We had Mr. Spock in the 60s. Then we have Avon. If Star Trek was the, basically the, um, well, the wagon train to the stars, which is what Gene Roddenberry called it, pitched it as, then Blake Seven, which was a British series, was the dirty dozen in space. Life was nasty, brutish, and short in, uh, in the, uh, the Blake Seven universe. Uh, people were backstabbing. Basically, the Blake Seven crew were a bunch of escaped convicts, none of whom trusted each other. Sounds a little bit like Farscape, actually, uh, now that I think about it. Uh, they didn't trust each other. They had to work together. Um, led by, by an idealist uh, captain who was basically the only convict who wasn't guilty on the ship, um, Blake. Uh, the characters were fighting the Federation. It was the anti-Star Trek. The Federation is good in Star Trek. The Federation is very bad in Blake 7. And so the convicts are the good guys, and they're fighting the authority. Second in command, basically, uh, first in everything in his own mind, but second in command on the ship was Avon. Avon. <clears throat> well, you know just by looking at his apparel, there's something going on with him. He basically looks like he shops in every... Uh, BDSM store in the galaxy. He wears black leather with silver studs on it. Uh, he smirks all the time and basically looks like he's expecting the right person to come up and spank him, and he would actually enjoy that. Um, Avon is, uh, is mean. Avon doesn't trust anyone. Uh, Avon puts himself basically first. If you think of all the Star Trek nerds that I discussed and Ilya Kuryakin, they were the ones to volunteer to go out and do the daring do. They were the brave heroes who would face any danger, right, to make things right. Avon's famous phrase, I am not expendable, I am not stupid, and I am not going. Avon took care of Avon. When, uh, when Blake kind of goes missing, Avon assumes 
uh, control of the ship uh, after the first couple of seasons of Blake Seven, and acts as the default leader, um, although he never really has legitimacy as the leader. Uh, so this, you see the nerd going from sidekick to partner, but not all the way to lead here. It's always obvious Blake is gone, and they're looking for Blake. And while Blake is gone, Avon's just keeping his seat warm, basically. So it's not, it's not that Avon is really the captain. Uh, and it ends very strangely when we find Blake, and Avon shoots him and kills him. Uh, so there's a lot of ambivalence about that. However, the fans for Avon were very clearly aware that he was the sexy nerd on the show. Um, Paul Darrow, who was the actor, uh, basically has made a career uh, since Blake Seven um, of being the guy who played Kerr Avon. Uh, and the fans kept up with him to the point he finally wrote a novel about his character, sort of an autobiography by Avon. Uh, he showed up at a whole bunch of fan conventions, uh, does uh, Blake Seven radio programs. So, so years later, he's still, you know, 20, 20 uh, some odd years later, uh, and with a movie in production, rumoredly. Uh, basically, the only character we know survived the last episode of Blake Seven is Avon. And according to the fans, that's really all you need. The other six, eh, forget them, because you got Avon, and Avon's the cool guy. Um, Something I should note is the reason that Avon was in prison to begin with was because he was a hacker. Uh, he was the computer man on the ship. He was the scientist. And what he'd done is basically hacked into banks and uh, taken, taken money for himself. He was uh, uh, the computer genius that nobody could track. And the only way the government got him in the end was because one of his partners ratted him out. Uh, but he had a long history of basically going in and and uh, coming in, uh, coming out under the radar where he could not be found. Um, it's clear that Avon's popularity uh, continues today. There is the Avon Club, the um, Liberovonis, which is Liber Avon is the group, the disgusting slavering Paul Darrow groupies, and my favorite, the Angels, Avon's next generation of eager love slaves. Uh, which are still active today, even though the show was canceled in 1981. Uh, it's absolutely clear that Avon, whether in t originally intended or not, uh, was and is a sexy nerd. Then the sexy nerd makes a great leap from being always second banana to being the lead in a series, uh, because The X-Files was about Fox Mulder. Um, lead character. Nerds have arrived. Uh, he's a scientist, albeit a social scientist, a psychologist, but he knows other nerds who can do the other things for him, like the lone gunman who can do uh, the legwork that he needs uh, when he needs it. Um, but let me give you a quote from one of the fans who's produced an amazing amount of, of fan work uh, based on Mulder, um, whom we interviewed for our, our article. Um, she says, Mulder is sexy, he's smart, there's angst, his personality, and ditto for Spock, by the way, grabs you by the brain and lurches you into his world. Uh, so it's, it's his brain that is what is so sexy, his nerdism. And clearly we see that he is a nerd. Uh, if you look in his apartment, he doesn't actually have a bed, right? He has a computer, he has a television, he has a DVD player. That's really all he needs, because he doesn't sleep, right? Uh, he's either on the computer or watching his DVDs. That's all, uh, because he doesn't have a life. And we don't want him to have a life. That's why we like him so much. Um, 1999, Bree Sharp. Any of you locals listen to Lightning, Lightning 100 heard uh, David Duchovny, the song. David Duchovny, I want you to love me, to kiss and to hug me, debrief and debug me. Uh, this song is definitely celebrating Fox Mulder as a sexy nerd. Yes. I'm sorry. Have a bed. 
this is true, but they actually make the comment, I didn't know you had a bed. It was kind of an inside joke, actually. That's a very good point. They do show a bed at one point, and he's astonished that it's actually there, right? So it's the, the, the twist is he didn't know he had a life, basically. So if it's, if it's there, he never actually used it, right? But that plays into the, that's a very good point. Um, but that also plays into the notion of being aloof, um, because we don't see Mulder with, you know, the steady girlfriend, e even as any of these other characters, basically. The only ones who get the girl get her in the very last episode, basically. Um, uh, and in the case of, of Avon, uh, she comes and then dies in his arms. So, uh, so it's only a very short-lived thing. Very good point. Um, so you have the Hunkus Intellecticus, the, uh, one of the fan clubs for Mulder, um, the Red Speedo Appreciation Society, um, the Church of Our Guy Mulder, um, the David Duchovny Estrogen Brigade, the Mulder Droolers, and my favor, favorite, um, Mulder Torture Anonymous, colon, because we always hurt the ones we really love. Uh, so Mulder uh, and apparently now is in talks for, um, for the next uh, X-Files movie. Um, Mulder is alive and well and certainly loved and recognized uh, as, as the sexy nerd and the leader here, really um, the great leap forward for sexy nerds everywhere because he is the lead of the series. Now, I don't want to in any way disrespect the next series because in its own ways it was another incredible leap forward. But as we were kind of plotting the trajectory of the sexy nerd, we did kind of see one step backwards. And that was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the nerds became the sidekicks once again, and often the butts of jokes. Um, not that these characters weren't sexy, because a lot of characters or a lot of uh, fans thought they were. Um, but these characters were unlucky in love. These characters weren't the lead in the series. Uh, these characters did the research. These characters uh, did the grunt work, all of the computer work, uh, Willow. Um, and they were in sidekick mode, basically. Well, this is true. Everybody was. Everybody was unlucky in love. But, um, for instance, the fan fiction that, that paired Buffy with Xander or Giles, a lot of it is out there, or fan art, um, these guys had never had a chance, right? Because they were nerd characters. Um, so, in a sense, uh, pardon? Um, he, the, the fact that he was bumbling, the fact he was part of the kind of Scooby group, um, this is true. This, but he had his own kind of street smarts, right? He had comics that he was constantly reading. He had his little phrases, which actually Giles picked up along the way, I think. Um, he, was not, he was not the nerd in the same way that Giles was, the bookish person. That's true. That's true. And of the three, he's probably the least cerebral. So I'll, I'll definitely buy that. But he had this kind of, um, uh, a missing piece would be supplied by him one way or the other kind of, kind of aspect, which is kind of why I, we lumped him in there. Um, but I'll agree with you. He's not in the sense the same traditional nerd essay Giles is, being, you know, the librarian. Um, but we didn't have the lead doing her own computer work or doing her own reading in the same way that Mulder was doing his. So we got to that, and this was where our original um, research ended because uh, we started this quite some time ago, and we were scratching our heads going, gee, wonder what's going to happen next. Hmm. But then we revisited that after some time, and we found out interesting things were happening after that. Uh, once again, the nerd gets to be lead with Farscape. Now, the first thought you might have is, John Crichton, he isn't a nerd. He's really cool. Well, yes, he's a cool, but he's a PhD in physics, right? Um, when we say it ain't rocket science, well, he does rocket science, basically in his sleep. Um, here you have a man who, uh, you know, can navigate wormholes and was the first human sent out in the Farscape project. This guy's really, really bright. So bright he doesn't have to act like a geek. He can sublimate that and be cool, but still pull on his smarts uh, anytime he needs them. Ask 1812, right, uh, how he is with computers, and 1812 will we'll tell you. Um, so John Crichton comes out, the black leather wearing, you know, muscle t-shirt wearing, ass kicking guy who gets the girl, occasionally is crystallized, but they bring him back and he still gets the girl, uh, uh, last week, and, uh, and things are good if you're John Crichton. 
He was a statue. This is true. He was a statue for a while too. Uh, uh, but he uh, he he gets action uh, in every sense of the word. Um, uh, bad things do happen to him, but he bounces back. Uh, we we love Crichton. What's amazing about Crichton is he's a PhD in physics who can think his way out of anything, and yet he also seems like every man that people can identify with and love. And that's really rare uh, that you could have that kind of character that would, you know, legitimately fit in with a large group of people. And you wouldn't say, oh, there's the nerd, but in fact, has a lot of nerd qualities. And when he comes back to Earth, that's pretty clear. When he's worried not only about the scientific aspects of what they've brought back, but also the policy aspects of what they've brought back. He is a thinking man, but he's also a man of action. And to that extent, um, Mulder was not. Interestingly enough, um, when, when Mulder came out, um, I want to check here and make sure I'm correct. Yes, it was People magazine that ran an article comparing David Duchovny to David McCallum's Ilya Kuryakin. And one of the things that they mentioned was both men were slight. David Duchovny was taller, but, um, you know, as the Red Speedo Brigade would admit, when he was in his Red Speedo, he was nice to look at, but he wasn't ass-kicking. Nobody would really be afraid of Mulder in a fight. Ask Krychek, even one-handed, he could, he could take on Mulder. Um, and, uh, and John Crichton is pumped. He's ripped, right? He's actually an action hero. You expect Mulder to go figure something out. You expect uh, Crichton to shoot first and try to figure something out in, in the middle of, of the action. But he's completely at ease being a physical hero as well, uh, well as um, uh, a cerebral hero. And so that's, that's very interesting. Other interesting things are going on. <clears throat> Um, on Andromeda, once again, you have a character who is a computer, uh, in a sense. She's an android. But she's even better than being an android. She is the warship. And ask, ask you know, any person who likes sexy nerds, that's damn cool. She is the warship. She's two people in one. Um, she is the voice of, uh, of the computer that reports, that, that explains, that is the very Vulcan character that doesn't show a lot of emotion and just explains what's going on. Uh, if you turn on the screen and you ask, you know, how, how are our shields? She reports back. Looks very good while doing so and has kind of the low cut outfit to, to prove that, but she's very kind of straight faced and is inside the computer, just the voice of the computer. But she's also the avatar of the ship, which means she walks around, she kicks, she fights, she deflects bullets. She goes where members of the crew cannot. She goes down to, the, to a planet, um, basically as part of what you know, Star Trek would call an away team. Uh, while the ship is above, she's on the ship dealing with things, but she's also on the planet you know, taking care of the bad guys. Um, you have huge, undeniably hunky Kevin Sorbo in the middle of a fight, and he says, oh, Rami, can you take care of this? And here this petite, beautiful young woman goes out and takes care of the bad guys because she can, because she's a warship, right? Um, the new, next season of Andromeda that's just begun, uh, Rami's had some problems. Robbie's been on ice for a little bit because of you know, the ship being kind of blown up. And, uh, and her new character, uh, she still looks like this when she is the, is the ship, but her avatar is now a blonde woman who resembles a Barbie doll. Um, yes, 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 good point. Former Baywatch beauty. Um, but yet when she speaks, she speaks with the voice of Rami, and we know that she still knows what's going on. Uh, and once the, the actress um, who played uh, Andromeda uh, is finished with her pregnancy and comes back, um, we don't know what exactly is going to happen with that, but it's just, it's good and good. You've got a, a tall, blonde, beautiful woman and a petite, uh, brunette, beautiful woman, and both of them are a warship. And as the, the uh, latest incarnation uh, of Rami, uh, recently said, I guess two weeks ago, um, I realized I am a warship and I don't run from a fight. And she proceeds to go kick the ass of a bunch of bad guys. So uh, the fact that she has her, her, she's hardwired to all the technology on the ship and knows everything and can, uh, can figure everything out, um, she's, she's a brain, but she's also, uh, you know, also the, the action hero. So a lot of interesting things are happening. Yes. Yes, Michael Shanks from Stargate. Another, 
another sexy nerd, absolutely. So sexy nerds are actually breeding. We should be excited. Um, I would say the most interesting thing to happen, you know, in the last two years to sexy nerds uh, is the show Firefly, which unfortunately lasted only one season, but will be out April 22nd, 2005, is the movie Serenity, and you need to go and go often. Um, there's, my, there's my personal statement. Um, uh, once again, good point. We've got Joss Whedon, who is at the, the helm of Buffy, um, and, and Angel, and, and all, of, uh, all of those related enterprises. And um, these characters, not the captain, but it doesn't really matter because the arc of, of the, uh, the whole Firefly slash Serenity project is, is about these two characters. And what you have are, are a really, really, really bright man and a super genius woman who happen to be brother and sister. Um, the doctor, uh, Simon, uh, is brilliant at the top of his class, uh, a, a intergalactically known surgeon who gives up everything to save his sister, who was such a genius the government took her and basically dissected her brain while she was still alive, and he rescues her from a research facility, and they're on the run. And uh, being on the run from the authorities, basically, why are they on the run? Because they're so smart. They are action characters, um, unlikely action characters, but when, when they're trying to get off the planet, uh, the woman who gets them out is a uh, teenaged uh, River Tam, who basically glances around the ship, stands back, does the mathematical calculation of where the men are, and then just whirls out and closes her eyes as unable to kill all of them in one shot because she's done the math. Um, she, uh, she's basically a human computer, except she's a broken computer. She's a, maybe a badly hacked computer, if you want to look at it that way, or at least a government screwed up computer. Uh, whereas uh, Simon is just a very, very brilliant man uh, and a very sympathetic character uh, in the series. So we are supposed to love both of them. And if you go and read the fan fiction right now from, uh, from the series, you'll find out they are both very, very loved. Um, so in that sense, you have sort of a, a long arc of what it ha has happened to the sexy nerd uh, across time. As I suggested before, and I didn't want to get into the statistics, because I think it's a lot more fun to look at the pictures of the sexy nerds for a talk, um, we were able to find critical moments, uh, sort of a, a, a moment uh, of um, correlation between a time when um, computers were being recognized, when, uh, oh, oh I, I'm sorry, one more thing I want to say about her. In the final aired episode, Objects in Space, it wasn't the final episode made, but the final aired episode of this series, um, River uh, metaphorically becomes the ship and identifies herself as the ship. So in that sense, she's sort of reverting back to a, an Andromeda slash Rami character. She becomes the technology. And she also walks around barefooted so she can feel the ship and she listens to the ship, and the ship talks to her. So in a sense, she's also sort of the human conduit between the rest of the crew and the ship itself, in a way that even the captain, who knows every inch of the ship, is not. So once again, you have that connection with technology. But anyway, as I go back, this correlation between moments when a certain degree of the populace is comfortable with a new aspect of technology. And the first being, uh, with Kiriakin and Spock, a combination of the, the second generation of supercomputers and the fact that this is the point um, where basically uh, you had the largest number of women entering college in the sciences uh, in the history of the United States. At that point, you have this kind of crucial shift, and suddenly you've got these sexy nerd guys on television, right? Um, it comes later then that you have have them becoming leads, and then have them becoming women. Uh, but this, this uh, phenomenon of you know, the, uh, the first personal computer really taking off and it being viable in the, in the minds of mainstream US or UK um, as something that we're going to live with a lot, and boom, you've got more nerds on television. Uh, you have the, uh, the laptop computer being uh, something that everyone assumes could, could own, would be a part of their lives, more nerds. You've got the wireless uh, revolution where people feel like they can access the internet at any time or use their phones anywhere, they're not tied down, boom, you've got more nerds. Um, 
And in fact, this has caused some uh, um, journalists to say that actually we are in the age of new nerdism or geek chic, that people actually want to be nerds because being nerds are cool. Uh, being nerds is a, is a sexy thing. Um, new York Magazine um, says that with the widespread use of computers now, um, quote, one day very soon we will all be geeks and we will celebrate it. And the best way, the obvious way that this new nerdism comes through is that the pictures we see of the nerds become prettier and prettier to look at. And so, of course, that follows then that we will see many more sexy nerds uh, in the future and, uh, and we will be happy. Thank you very much. trying to get back on schedule here, but if we do have any questions, that would be very cool. That's, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, I'm not sure they expected Kaylee uh, on Firefly to be as popular as she has been. Um, we were supposed to love her because, uh, because she was sweet. And as Joss Whedon has said, if she likes somebody, you know they're good. She's kind of the, um, the conscience of everyone. Um, but I don't think she was supposed, originally Joss Whedon expected her to be, as far as body image was concerned, the kind of character you would expect to eat the second cheeseburger. And actually the character uh, gain something like 25 pounds in order to play the character. So they were not creating her as the sort of seven of nine goddess figure. And yet she's become very, very popular. And, you, and I'm glad you mentioned her, actually, because also um, she has that connection with the ship, being the engineer. We see in one of the flashback episodes, the engineer was a guy. And he looked, you know, greasy, the kind of grease monkey person you expect to be underneath a car or something with a wrench. Except it was very clear he really didn't know his stuff. And, uh, and we see Kaylee, who's this cute, sweet little girl who looks like she needs to be out picking flowers somewhere, um, being able to listen to the ship and know what's wrong. And, uh, and she, she calls Serenity her girl, and she pats her girl, and she talks to her girl. And she's, she's another, like River, another kind of conduit um, between the humanity and the mechanics on the ship. So that's very good. Actually, I need to add her next time. That's, I appreciate that. Um, uh, but an unlikely one, one that, that I don't think was ever meant to be sexy in the same way that, you know, Simon Tab was, was a cute actor and they knew that he'd be a heartthrob kind of thing. So, very good point. Thank you. Yes? Um, if you wanted to go for the sort of evolution of a character, you can go back to the original Buffy where you had Wesley Wyndham Price III, who was the ultimate nerd, you know, completely bookish. And then he morphs when he goes over to Angel until the very end, where he is still very bookish, and yet he is your complete action hero as well. That's a very good point. Very good point. Good and that friend. was a... I'm sorry? Yes. 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 And, and that was a conscious choice, too, for that evolution. And that's a good point. It's interesting that they felt he had to lose certain things in order to become certain things. But, uh, but that's, a, that's a very interesting case study. That would be good to... True. Right, right, and, and, uh, and basically a sort of sidekick slash partner, depending on how you look at it in that sense. Right, and he becomes the de facto head, so very good point. Very good, thank you. Oh, it is working, okay. Oh, you have to, s okay. So d how much, <laughs> how much do you think that it's, uh, you know, when it started out, it seems that it was not as deliberate on the part of the producers as it has become later. Right. You know, Spock and Ilya, nobody really expected them to be so popular or so sexy. But then, of course, right. uh, using an example that's been mentioned, you know, Daniel Jackson, I mean, good grief, the man has, you know, biceps like tree trunks and, and is beautiful. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so uh, that right. was a deliberate, and, and, you know, he was, he was definitely cast as a bit of cheesecake. So I think now mm. the producers, but they even, they got surprised by Odo. But right. it's interesting that it's more, that it is more deliberate now that they were cashing in. No, I think you're exactly right. And I think part of that's the sophistication of the networks. And part of that is because um, basically of the fragmentation of the networks. You have something on, um, you know, basic, one of the basic uh, networks, major channels, 
Um, they don't, you know, they've got a very, very wide net. But you have something on the sci-fi channel. They know they're going to have to have the cerebral hunk or the people won't, won't be interested um, because you have a cerebral audience. And I'm not saying that to stroke ourselves, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, the demographically, they have to be smart if they're going to be sexy uh, because they know where their demographic is. In the same way that, that they knew what to do with T'Pol when they cast her. Um, they, they said, oh, we've got a Vulcan. She's got to know her stuff. Let's get a Maxine model, right? Because smart, sexy, right? Um, uh, and they knew who was going to be watching, and that was young guys, but smart guys. So she needed to have both. Um, so I think the sophistication there, but then they still get surprised. Kaylee, an example. Odo, an example. And Odo, I think, is, is different than Kaylee in a way. Uh, Kaylee was more an, uh, an issue of body image. Odo was more the fact that Rene Abrigenois was not a young man. And so they didn't expect that a character who's basically a middle-aged actor under a ton of, of you know, latex face mix makeup uh, would become somebody. Actually, to a smaller degree, Andy Robinson playing Garrick in the same, in the same show was also a brutal spy, basically, um, who, who played uh, his character you know, very, very uh, uh, intelligently, uh, became kind of a cult phenomenon. And they had to keep bringing him back and keep bringing him back, a character that was just supposed to be there a little bit, but under a ton of prosthetic makeup. You know, we didn't even really know what he looked like. And certainly, uh, even if we knew what Rene Abergenois looked like, that wasn't something that was supposed to be, you know, exciting to us. And yet, it was. So, good, good, uh, good point. Yeah. Uh, two questions. One, within the continuum of sexy and nerd, where would you put Indiana Jones? And, ah. w and would Daria fit in? Would she win the prize as the first animated sexy nerd? That's, that is a great question. Yeah, because Lisa Simpson's a little too young, right? So, but you, and, um, and she's a little too idealistic. Daria is enough of a cynic that she gets in. Oh, that's a great point, actually. Um, we, we hadn't thought of going in that way, but that's a, very, that's a great point. Um, uh, so, yes, yes, I'd say that. Um, Indiana Jones, absolutely. Um, and actually, Indiana Jones uh, fits a type I didn't mention that tends to be usually more in film, although we do see it sometimes in television. Um, my colleague at Rutgers calls this the Superman complex, um, where the sexy nerd can't be a sexy nerd all the time. So you have Clark Kent, who is a thorough nerd, and then you have Superman, who's a total, you know, sexy guy. Um, in that sense, Indiana Jones is the professor, who can be a little dorky sometimes, although obviously the women still think he's hot, because they know he's going to turn into Indiana Jones, right? They can see it. Um, but, uh, but when he's in professor mode and he's got his little glasses and he's got, you know, his little tweed on, he doesn't look as great as when he's indie and he's got his, you know, sweat stained shirt ripped open and he's got his whip and he's, you know, and then we know he's hot, right? Um, but he has, he makes that transformation. He's not swinging through the halls of the university. He's walking, carrying books, and muttering to himself, right? Uh, and so in that sense, you've got the kind of Clark Kent, uh, Superman, uh, phenomenon going on there. Um... You, you can be one or the other, but, but absolutely. And he's, he, uh, if we had brought film into this, I think it would probably be all about him because he just kind of sets the standard. So that's a great, that's a great image. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, this may be a bit of an unanswerable question, but I wonder if you and your colleague have uh, discussed uh, the reasons. You mentioned correlation with um, comfortableness with technology, if I can use the word comfortableness. And uh, do you suppose the rise of the nerd hero is uh, a function of our love affair with technology, or as sexuality is sometimes a manifestation of our subconscious fears, do you think, and also a lot of these heroes are rendered vulnerable <laughs> in many yes. of these episodes, do you suppose it's an effort to, for us to come to terms with technological advances? That's great. I'm or a little of both. <laughs> I think, yeah, I definitely think both of those things are going on. I think that's actually great, a great image because um, I'm, I'm thinking here of Seven of Nine. She's really scary when she's Borg. Um, and as the things kind of come off, I mean physically off of her face, the wires and the hooks and the blinking lights, 
then she's less scary, and then we can love her, and then we can make her our friend, and then, then she can eat dinner with the crew, and then she can kiss one of the crew, and, and it's sort of taming that kind of scariness. Uh, in the same way, I think, even going back to Spock and Ilya, um, one of the things when we were interviewing uh, people, I forgot to say when I was talking about Ilya, the Kuryakin file, which is a fanzine of Ilya fan fiction, is still being printed regularly today. It boggles my mind. A lot of the people who are writing Man from Uncle fan fiction were not born when the series first aired, but they fell in love with the character. Um, basically through reading fan fiction, because for quite a while the Man from Uncle was not being syndicated and was not available on video, from reading about him in his, you know, workshop in the in the lab uh, at home, this cerebral character, they fell in love with him and wrote about him, and then they got to see the show and oh, he really is as cute as they say he was, right? Um, but uh, but in a sense. Um, kind of to master or, or take care of, depending on how you look at it, that character, who represents something that's so scary. And he did it even better because he was also Russian. He, he was scary in a sense of alien technology that could come back and kill us, right? Because he's sort of like kind of, you know, a short blonde Adam mom walking around, you know, oh, this could be turned against us someday. So, so let's hurt him really bad and then take care of him, right? So, so this, there's a lot of psychological stuff going on there. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, and I, I don't want to suggest that this is a causality between the, the link between the technology and this. It's just a, um, a correlation, not a causation. But we found it interesting that that was there. And I think, I think making the other less foreign, bringing it into our dens every week, um, and then, you know, getting to hug it and squeeze it and call it our own <laughs> was, was, was definitely um, making it less frighting, frightening and, uh, uh, and getting to dominate it in a way, which is kind of kind of weird when you think about it. So good stuff. Good stuff. This is great. Um, yes. Has there, uh, according to your, I think what you're saying, as, as this goes on, there should be a female lead nerd. Yes. Has yes. that existed? I yes. Didn't, I didn't see it. Daria, if you go, yeah, Daria's there. Um, We've got to bring Daria in. That's great. That's great stuff. Um, uh, the closest I can think of um, is a pretty obscure, but the really, truly brilliant television series, which I think was just ahead of its time. I'd love to see it come back. I think it would work now. VR5. I don't know if anyone remembers this. Uh, the virtual reality show, Lori Singer um, played uh, Sydney. Uh, the lead character, beautiful young woman, and she was in every sense a stereotypical nerd. Uh, she dressed horribly. She didn't care what she dressed in. She wore uh, jeans and huge baggy shirts, even though she was slender and gorgeous. Um, she, uh, she worked for the telephone company only so that she could make sure she was always wired um, because she was terrified of losing her access. This was enough years ago that this was a really big thing, you know, that you were being able to be on the, on the net. And, uh, and so she was, you know, the wonderful um, uh, phone woman who would go and make sure everybody could access the Internet. But, uh, but she was very socially awkward, and she was bookish. Uh, interestingly enough, two of our past nerds, Ilya Kuryakin and Giles, um, were both in the show. Uh, David McCallum and Anthony Head were both in the series. Their places were reversed. Anthony Head was the spy, and uh, David McCallum was the researcher. Um, but they both came as support behind her, but she was the lead. And she was the only one, actually genetically, she was the only one who could control this next virtual reality program. Um, I think it was just too much too soon. Uh, I would l dearly love to see that show brought back because I think she was a fantastic character. I think the other um, more mainstream way this happened was the post Mulder Scully. Um, because when Scully was repartnered after Mulder, was zapped, uh, was taken away for a while. He's just away. Mulder who? And uh, uh, she was partnered with a character that became the skeptic, and she became the believer. And so she did a flip-flop in her science. Um, and instead of being the skeptical scientist, she was the active scientist in charge of basically finding all of these, these things. Uh, and she led the show. And Robert Patrick's character, John Doggett, was definitely second fiddle. And we knew through the entire two seasons he did that, that he did not know everything she knew. She was withholding information from him. And, uh, and so she was basically top dog there. And that was, 
and she was also very active, which was amazing because she stayed she stayed pregnant on the show for like 15 months. Nobody seemed to notice. She also didn't get any bigger. Nobody seemed to notice. And she ran in her stiletto heels and she shot people. And it was really cool because Scully was just getting to be awesome, you know. Uh, and then it ended. But um, but those that role reversal there, I think, was probably the closest. But I'm expecting it. We've seen really close things. Dark Angel, we've, uh, Alias. We've seen things um, where the technology aspect, where... But I'm not prepared yet to call out either of those women complete nerds. Um, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting um, for you know Andromeda to come forward and say, "No, Dylan Hunt, I'm running the ship," and then that will that will happen. It's going to though I, if if the progression follows the way we think it does. Um, so good question, Daria. I got to remember Daria. It's great stuff. Okay, thank you so much for your time and attention. I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you. Thank you so much.